Welcome, 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 everyone, to Generally Irritable. I always love that intro. And I think that is a great that intro. Time. Isn't it fabulous? It Benjamin is did that for me. Yeah, my husband made that intro for me. And one of his business partners is a music producer. So that's even my own personal, like, special one of a kind intro made for me. That's fantastic. It makes me feel pretty badass. I don't know if that's something that can get you censored. Can you say ass? Yeah. And it be and it's not bad. Like we don't swear on this program. Um, or I try not to, and I try to tell people that. So Chris, if I didn't tell you that before we got started, try not to swear. But you're pretty good about that. Um yeah, I try. Yeah, I try. so I'm super excited. Okay, so I'm super duper excited today to have Christopher Aaron Paul on the program. He is the communications chair of the Chittenden County Republican Party. How are you this evening, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Erica. It's Excellent. A fantastic intro. I absolutely love that intro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very pleased. And um, there will be some other products coming up for sale soon if anybody really loves that silly ridiculous eagle there might be something that you can purchase with that stupid eagle on it at some point in the future that's coming down the pike i've got space on this that. shelf right here for eric <laughs> riding an eagle right here on this shelf uh, <laughs> oh my god we should make a um i should get a like a a superhero character i wonder if i can get a figurine made <gasps> okay, that is not what we came here to talk about. Okay, I am digressing. I am totally Next digressing. Time. Okay, time. okay, okay. But really, I am thinking about that now. Okay, I'm really excited to have Christopher Aaron on tonight to talk about what the GOP is up to. Um, I'm, I'm especially encouraged to have Christopher on. And after I give you this little intro, Christopher, I want you to get, I want you to tell everybody your name and like kind of, you know, give a little bio and what, you know, why you're, uh, why you affiliate with the Republican party. Um, but this is why I'm especially excited for you to be on tonight. Uh, so just this week I was at a store that shall go unnamed because, you know how it is around here. If you're a Republican, like your business is trash. So I went to the store. They know me. Uh, they know that I ran for office. The gals that work there voted for me. And the one of them was like, oh, are you going to run again? What are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. You know, the way people treat Republicans here was, was really hard. You know, it's like um, there is really a strong bias uh, and prejudice against conservatives in Vermont that somehow we're all white supremacist, racists. It doesn't, and, and oh, homophobic, transphobic, uh, every kind of phobic. We're basically just evil people. And I said, and that's really hard to tolerate. Like, I, I can't even get through to argue about ideas because I'm too busy being attacked as a, as a person that I'm not and having to defend that. And this, and so I was talking to this one lady who's, who's new there and she was like, well, that's not fair. That's not right. And I said, I know. And she said, I said, and what's really funny is so many people don't like what's going on either in Burlington or the state of Vermont. They don't like the woke politics. They don't like the treating conservatives badly. They don't like the demonization of the police. They don't like, uh, you know, higher taxes. They don't like the lockdowns, but they consider themselves Democrats and progressives. Mm. And the people on their team are pushing for all those things that they don't like. And it's like, look, I know you don't consider yourself a conservative and I know you don't consider yourself a Republican, but we agree that this stuff is bad. Come to the dark side. Mm. You know, because yeah. we really are. We're the ones fighting against that stuff. We're the ones fighting against critical race theory in the schools, um, teaching children uh, to be racist, uh, in, essentially, and, you know, to demonize one another. You know, we're all fighting against this. We don't like it. Give the Republican Party a shot. I know you think that it's one thing, but come give us a shot. And 
so I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what it is that we're up to in Chittenden County, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, some solutions, like I love your idea about the condos, uh, converting to condos, like things that will uh, make home ownership better. Like the solutions that we have as conservatives that are actually better and more likely to get the desired result of the misguided policies of our progressive and democratic counterparts. So that was a lot of words. That That's kind lot. of what we're going to be talking about okay. today. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to give people a setup. No, that's good. And tell them and I and one of, and so I want you to introduce yourself and then one of the things don't let me forget to talk about is uh when our next meetings are coming up and how they can come get involved. So don't okay. let, me, uh, let me, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it down. Okay. Now tell everybody who you are and why you're so fabulous and how you came to affiliate yourself with the GOP. Okay. So yes. my name is Christopher Aaron Felker. I am 42 years old and a resident of Burlington, Vermont. I've been living here since 2013. We moved to Vermont in 2012. Mm. Uh, we were living in Pennsylvania and I grew up in Pennsylvania. It was a great place, but uh, I, I, we wanted someplace, uh, someplace new to start our family and, and Vermont seemed like a great spot to do that. Um, a lot less people here, less uh, densely populated, uh, more access to rural areas. And, and that's just, we wanted to downshift a little bit to mm. a, a, sl a slower speed of life. So uh, we came up here and I'd always been, I'd voted Republican before back in, I voted for George, George W. Bush. Oh, um, I did. oh I did. you're not I allowed to admit that out loud. I did, I voted for George W. Bush <laughs> and I voted for John McCain. Ah, all right, all right. Of course I did. Okay. I'm a Navy veteran. I voted for John McCain. Of course I did. Of course. All right, all right. Um. So I, I've always had, uh, I've had no problem voting Republican before, um, and I, I still have no problem with it. I think that you touch base upon, a, you know, a really, a really key point that is kind of indicative of a greater problem in our society. It's that people are so quick to judge um, an individual strictly based upon uh, their perception of their politics without even taking the time to engage with them to find out what mm -hmm. those politics really truly are. And and yep. that that's kind of um, a frightening place to be at because if we are walking around and just uh, thumbs up and thumbs down condemning or approving of somebody within three seconds, you know, I, that swipe left, mm -hmm. swipe right culture is, is not, is not where we should be um, trying to, it's not, it's not advancing our society. It's not bringing the best out and yeah. people. We aren't learning from each other. There's no chance to really learn from each other if we're going to treat each other so disposably. Mm, I think that is such an important point that you bring up. We're treating each other disposably. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. it doesn't matter if it's, oh, we're just going to, I'm just going to have sex with whomever and you know, and then we're not going to have a relationship or I'm just going to, oh, it's, uh, it's, everything is about me and my happiness and my truth. And so if you're harshing my mellow, I'm just going to not be in your life anymore. It can't be that like relationships are hard and human beings are complicated and worth trying to figure out. It's, oh, it just, it, it, it makes me uncomfortable. So I'm just going to bounce. And it's all across the country. Think about even look at Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, the darling of the left just a couple of years ago welcomed and paraded around like George Takei. Welcome to the community. And then this yep. past week, George comes out and says, you know, that uh, she is an embarrassment. Uh, well, you know, this is this is horrible to treat people like this. You know, uh, Jenner has yeah, a really good great. point when it comes down to um, protecting women's sports. And there are there there is nuance to this argument. And, and there's it's not as cut and dry as it was one might think at times, but there are really hard cut and dry points to it. And and allowing this um, self-identification to just allow 
mediocre males to dominate female sports is unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And totally yeah, a violation of the spirit of Title IX. I'm sorry, but Title IX was designed to give women, the female sex, an equal opportunity in sports and allowing males to self-identify as women and allowing the courts to interpret Title IX to be not constrained by sex biologically, but by self-determined gender, that, that perverts the whole point of Title IX. Well, and what better person to be able to judge the fairness of something? Now, I, I don't, I, to confess, I don't know a ton about Caitlyn Jenner, only I had never heard of her or Bruce Jenner until she transitioned. I want to try to be respectful. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, okay. I might screw it up, but I'm going to try to be respectful. So Bruce Jenner was an Olympic athlete. So if there's anybody who understands what is required in athletics and physicality, wouldn't it be an athlete, an Olympic athlete? Like who better to determine the fairness than somebody who actually was, did the thing that we're talking about? Yeah. Is that crazy of me? Oh my goodness. All right. We're getting all controversial right off the top. Right off Look the at bat. us. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't no, help but to, myself. But to your point, to your point though, Caitlyn Jenner was great as long as she was parroting the lines that they wanted her to parrot. And as soon as she shared that she had a, a, an opinion that was different, they threw her out. And, and that's what I'm talking about, right? It's that disposable. It's the disposable. You know, oh, you're a free thinker. We can't have that. Bye bye. Uh, you know, and I see that the, I think I, I think I might've told you the story about when I was running for office and somebody said something about me being a racist or something. And I, and I, and I quipped, I made a joke, you know, smart, smart mouth response. I said, Oh, well, I guess I'll tell my black husband that he married a racist. And the, and the woman responded, well, he must have internalized the white supremacy if he's a conservative or, you know, is with you. And I was like, Oh, so what you're saying is my husband is dim-witted and can't think for himself. Right. Right. I don't know what's more racist than that. Right. The and, and I racism don't know of how low expectations, you know, like and and low diminished capacities. It's it's so they don't even realize they're doing it, which is the really, really astounding part of it, because they are going out of their way to condemn you and you and you, the viewer. They are going out of their way to condemn you and arrogantly um, proclaiming these your violations or sins. But while they're doing it, they are espousing and confessing their own racist beliefs. And they don't even realize you're, they're doing it. You're saying that you think black people are stupid and yeah. incapable. And, and not able to overcome or take care of themselves. And I don't understand how they don't know that what they're saying is racist. Not able to go and get an ID to be able to vote. Uh, that seems to be one of the big, um, big talking points that the left has uh, regarding the Georgia um, voting, um, voting yep, the, the new voter bill. Yep. Yep. And I, when you actually dive into it, you see that uh, the, Bill, the new law actually allows for people who don't have a driver's license or a photo ID. It allows for them to go in and get a a, a voter ID card for free, for free, for free, for free. So, for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it's it's astounding how they try to pervert every conversation into the old standby of you're racist. Well, no, it, you're just using that because you are incapable of having a decent, fair conversation on the yes. subject of voting security. And why shouldn't we be having a conversation about voting security? We did just have the last four years of everybody screaming about how Vladimir Putin was influencing the elections. Well, oh my God, this is this is what is so funny. This is what I love. You four years ago, you were sure that like, it was corruption and election integrity and Donald Trump 
used the system and cheated. But this one, it can't be that it was also rigged or right. cheated or right. anything else. I'm just saying, if you think that our elections are um, vulnerable, they're vulnerable every time. They're, they're vulnerable, vulnerable every, every single year. Mm hmm. And they were vulnerable this past election cycle. You heard it on the news. It was kind of buried, but you heard about how North Korea and and Iran were trying to influence the election. And in addition to Vladimir Putin and Russia and the, all these standards, the China and all these nations always try to influence elections. And guess what? Um, they learned it by watching us. Well, and you, so mom and dad, I learned it by watching you. Of course. <laughs> oh my god! Well, and that's the thing. Like, if you believe that there is foreign interference and that people are trying to mess with our elections, wouldn't you want to have more safeguards in place, not less? You'd think so. This is this is one of those dichotomies that I don't understand. How they don't understand is I'm. I want everyone to vote who's allowed to vote. I don't like I don't think that felons should get their right to vote taken away. Some states do that. Vermont doesn't, but some states do that. I don't think that's fair. I understand I don't I don't think any rights should be taken away, but that's a whole other conversation. Well, that's a whole other conversation. But yeah. <laughs> I take back my comment. I'll have to think about that a little bit heavier. But in all seriousness, like we want people to vote. We want people to be, we don't want anybody to feel disaffected, but what better way to ensure that your voting population feels disaffected or disconnected or, you know, whatever than to not require IDs, not require, like how else can I think that my vote doesn't matter if you let all of the college kids who aren't even legal residents vote? don't you want us to have faith in the elections? Don't you want there to be election integrity? Don't you want to know that if there was foreign interference, we'd be able to catch it? That doesn't mean less safeguards. It just doesn't. Yeah. And I find it astounding that it's 2021 and we're debating uh, the efficacy of signature matching as if a computer couldn't match a signature in less than 15 seconds. Um, all you really have to do is scan the ballot in and see if the signature uh, matches up a, with any one of, you know, Erica Reddick or Chris Raren Felker's signatures that are on file. And if it's close, then it, it, it passes and your ballot is, is approved and accepted. And if it doesn't, it gets bounced back to a bounce back pile and you are then contacted to see if you can come in and correct it. Remedy um, it. Yep. Exactly. The, to say that that it's somehow there's no need for this. And, and in the last week, I've been hearing this phrase a lot. Uh, the Republican voting security bills are all solutions mm. in search of a problem. Um, what? Well, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. I don't even get that. I don't wait. Well, are we they, hear it. We hear it a lot. With, we hear it a lot when it's um, tossed around towards the progressives in our state with that. They are, presenting solutions to problems that don't really exist. Well, this is a problem that exists. And while you might not be able to point to widespread voter fraud, that doesn't mean that an individual can't fraudulently sign a, a mail-in ballot to somebody who lives in their house and then mail it in and just get, um, get away because they aren't creating widespread fraud. It's multiple cases of minor fraud. But well, multiple cases of minor fraud add up, especially if you live in a small rural area like here, where some elections are decided by 29 votes, you know? Literally. What was Literally. it? The mayoral race was won by 129 votes? 129. And even the last election speaker, Mitzi Johnson, lost her seat by a, in the 20s or like 19 votes or something like That's that. That's right. Very, very small margins here. That's so, right. You know, there are these live ballots that go out that are not getting signature match. Like they, they can present an issue, you know, where elections are decided by them. So it's almost like they have to figure out a way to twist everything we do around as being racist just to discredit us. And then they wonder why we're suspicious of them. 
Like you can't argue with me on the merits of what I'm saying and the reasonable, rational stuff you and I just exchanged. You say, oh no, it's racist because black people are too stupid to get an ID. Like, so you demean the people you supposedly care about in order to demean your political rivals to get your desired outcome. Well, you have to realize too that these people, since you hear these same negative um, snide comments being thrown around, uh, they're almost brainwashed talking points. They really can't back them up either. It's just screeching, that's racist and uh, condemning you and then walking away. Now you're canceled because now they don't have to actually engage in the issues. Mm. But it's indicative again of how of they believe they're one thing, but their actions are very much the opposite. And and that's uh, that's super cheap because, you know, they get to feel superior, but they don't have to put in any of the work or actually try and solve any problems that come up. Uh, you know, we talk about wanting, we talk about wanting everybody who's eligible to vote to be able to vote um, and not wanting to disenfranchise anybody. But then we go through and this past election cycle on town meeting day, we, uh, through a ballot initiative, uh, approved rank choice voting for the second time in Burlington. And that's if, already been repealed, voted it's already in, been repealed. and then repealed. For those who don't have prior knowledge, Burlington has had an experience with ranked choice voting in the early 2000s that did not fare well. Um, and a mayoral election was decided by um, the ranked choice voting manner instead of whoever had the plurality of votes. And, and there were negative consequences that came from some of those uh, the, that election that Burlington was still trying to dig out of for quite some time. And there are many volumes to this story. And if you're interested, please look up, the, but we won't, we won't dive too deep into it now. But the truth is um, because of Burlington's history in this subject, UVM, the University of Vermont right here in Burlington, uh, came up with a study that was, that discussed the problems and with ranked choice voting. And they mm -hmm. specifically talked about, there are a few paradoxes that come up that um, are just like statistical anomalies that can really swing an election when ranked choice voting is being utilized. But it also talks about, here we go. The Vermont Legislative Research Shop commissioned the report and it talked about how ranked choice voting has serious challenges and to people with unequal amounts of knowledge, understanding, education, ethnic and language groupings. So what? all the groups of new Americans and people that we actually want to bring into um, the town square and extend voting rights to, we are actually making it harder for them to vote uh, by pushing ranked choice voting. They are less likely, if you are if you are of a it's lower socioeconomic status, if you don't have a higher, okay. degree, higher education degree, if English is your second language, if you, yeah, um, these groups are not likely to rank votes. They might vote once, um, but they also talk about how the voting is intimidating and they don't, they're less likely to vote. So wow. what are we doing here? Like if you, who's actually benefiting from the ranking of votes if half the populace isn't ranking votes? Are we just letting people have like a second kind of dip at the, um, a second vote, which in my yeah. opinion seems well, to kind of violate guy, that one person, guess, one vote. Right. It really does. It does. It really does. Especially when others aren't able to participate fully because of either poor messaging or education around it, or just the fact that it is ultimately kind of confusing to think that instead of voting for the candidate that you like the best, that you should go in there with some kind of formula where you might have the person that you like the best, the ranked second, and then the person that you kind of like the first, but the person that you really don't like the four, you know, it's almost nauseating for me to have to try and figure that out right now. Yeah, that is okay. So what's, what's really funny about how you mentioned that this actually disenfranchises the same people that our city council and our mayor supposedly want to enfranchise. Mm -hmm. Is that a word? Enfranchise? 
or disen it has to be disenfranchises, but whatever. So that is the same as one of the other charter changes that proposals that passed um, the um, no cause evictions. So what happens is I'm a landlord and I've got a and I've got a bad tenant who maybe I haven't been able to catch breaking the law or they haven't I haven't been able to prove that they're breaking the law but maybe they're you know skirting up the line of sexually harassing the other tenants or just being an asshole. Oops, I don't think I'm allowed to say that. You said no um, cursing, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> I know. I'm so I told I have a trucker mouth. Uh it's not good. But you know, you know, maybe they're harassing. Maybe that person is a is an actual racist. Maybe they're a jerk. Maybe they're harassing the other tenants in some way. But it's like not quite to the level of being able to arrest them or have a cause eviction. It's going to be in the lower income areas that this is going to have the most effect. It's not going to be your well-to-do, uh, well adjusted people, it's going to be people who, you know, have less control over where they can live. And that if, if we believe that what you're saying is that the people who are the most vulnerable are black, brown, you know, I hate saying BIPOC, not white people. Well, then you're, then you're putting not white people in a position to be vulnerable again. Precisely. Uh, there, oh, man. When it comes to Burlington and housing, there are so many, so many layers to the problems and and oh. generational failures of how this city and this municipality has not um, kept up or maintained responsible growth. Burlington has for the last eight to nine years had a vacancy rate of approximately two and a half percent that is dangerously wow. low um vacancy rates that are um promote healthy um a healthy marketplace are somewhere around like six or seven percent um oh, wow so uh, a low vacancy rate means less housing becomes available and it becomes harder for people to obtain that housing it also creates a spike in demand for it which in increases the overall rental costs um yeah. And and what has Burlington done to address this problem? Uh, next to nothing. They well, and that's not not only next to. I, let me just say, I just I just have to say this: if Burlington is systemically racist, if Burlington is so racist, systemically racist, and so trash, then it is the Democrats and progressives' fault. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're 100% there, right. Chris Rock said in an interview, you don't have to put up a sign that says no blacks allowed. All you have to do is make the houses all out of their price range. And that's exactly what they've done in this house, in this city. They've obstructed all responsible growth for two generations, at least, um, that has caused a, a decrease in housing stock, a rise, an a rise in their property values to something to a point that it is almost almost ludicrous when you're looking at some of these clap shacks that are 150 years old and they're asking for a four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for them and you're thinking yeah. man that second floor slope ceiling is a nightmare you know there's a remediation hellhole inside there someplace like what is and you and the soil's contaminated well, and that's the same people have been in charge of this city for decades. decades. Dems and progressives, uh, Dem prograts, as my friend Paul calls them, have literally been in charge for decades. And I can't help but think I have a little conspiracy theory going on that those same people in charge are also friends with a lot of the big landowners and the and the developers and stuff like that they have a vested interest in making sure that their property value just goes like this. They're You're the ones in charge. Right. And nobody has, well, if you realize that Bur the makeup of the Burlington electorate, like there's a large percentage of Democrats and progressives who are homeowners here, obviously, mm -hmm. 
Um, but they are, they have no motivation to really act to make sure that we solve our housing pr crisis here. Mm -hmm. um, because yep. by not acting, by still opposing any kind of responsible growth that brings in uh, new housing mm -hmm. and new housing opportunities for families, uh, by saying no and not in my backyard and obstructing, uh, they're able to reap the benefits of that by the decreased housing supply, um, which creates mm -hmm. a higher demand and their ho own housing prices go yep. up. Um, and they love that. But then when um, when reappraisal, reassessment time comes around, they, they're freaking out about how um, their houses are now $100,000 more expensive than they, than they uh, were before. And they're going to have to pay taxes on that. Well, if you didn't obstruct all development for the last 15 years, then that tax base would have been able to be spread around a little bit more. Your property values would not have elevated so much because guess what? Your house doesn't look that great to begin with. So um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no reason why the, all these homes are half a million dollars around here. They're like monopoly houses. Like they're garbage. It's, it is wild <laughs> to me. It is absolutely wild to me. I just go... I, I've loved seeing everybody freak out about the assessment. Ours doubled. Yeah. Uh, ours doubled. A lot of other people's have doubled. And I'm like, why are you surprised? <laughs> I don't understand how you can be surprised. Yeah. But so I want you to talk a little bit about your, um, the idea that you proposed at the GOP meeting last oh, okay. month. So, um, so bringing it back home to the, Republican party here, okay. uh, whether Burlington, Chittenden County state party, um, you had an awesome idea that you brought to the, to the, to the meeting that I think people should hear. And that is, I'm going to get it wrong. So you got to fit, you got to correct me there. People can turn their multi family homes into condos, right? Yes. Did I get that right. So, so like, as an example, condo I've or got a triplex. Mm-hmm. And I could turn it into three condos or a, well, and I'm saying all this in theory, it depends on zoning and blah, blah, blah. But, okay, so get, tell everybody the pitch. Tell everybody the pitch you gave okay. us at the meeting. So here we go. This brings us back to, again, ballot initiatives. And so this past town meeting day, in addition to what we were just talking about with uh, just cause eviction, in Burlington. That was a ballot initiative that was passed and that limits the landlord's ability to mm -hmm. uh, decide whether or not to renew a tenant's lease. Uh, essentially stripping the landlord the, of the right to, to choose to lease to somebody else at any given time when the contract has ended. It, it forces a landlord or requires them once they've signed a lease with a tenant to extend that lease almost indefinitely until mm -hmm. unless they are convicted of a crime or or right. um, have a legitimate other causes for violating their lease. That makes it difficult. Can't. Um, but in addition to the just cause eviction, simultaneously, Burlington also had the thermal energy systems charter change that came up, which requires landlords to change over their heating systems in all their units from energy efficient natural gas to electric. Um, this might not be a big of a deal to others in the lower portion of the United States where you don't have such brutal winters as Vermont, but we do have pretty brutal winters here in Vermont and, and Our, electric heat just won't cut it. It so, will literally at least triple our heating costs every year, yes. at least. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt, it'll, it, it will cause a dramatic increase in the electricity use of individual tenants all throughout Burlington. And means, but even and, and more importantly, means, is the cost that the landlords are going to have to, t to absorb by having to switch all these systems over. Well, that's the thing. Like, what do you think when it costs like 10 grand for a new furnace and I've got to put three in? Right. Like, so not only do you want me to absorb, well, it probably, well, the one's bigger, that's like 10 or 12. 
and then maybe like eight or 10, and then the other one's got a little one. So we're, we're going to easily spend 20, 25 grand on new furnaces. And then I'm going to have to raise my rent to pay for that because we don't make 30 grand in a year in income to pay for it. And so I'm going to have to pass that cost on to my tenants and then their electric bills are going to triple. Mm -hmm. Making it And that's more just one layer because here. there are other tax increases that are coming that then also have to get passed along. So now we're making it even less affordable to live in Burlington. And Burlington already has a very high um rental cost we are about i think 80 yes. percent above the, the national the mean yep uh for a small town of about forty five thousand people uh it's it's quite expensive to live here and and i understand there are selling points to the accessibility in burlington and how you don't necessarily need a car and there are those city selling points to burlington but mm. uh city council seems to have no problem spending property owners money and then coming yeah. around for a, a second round to tax them so well, this brings us back it, to the point of oh go ahead no i was gonna say it's they literally all i can imagine is that they just do not consider the second and third order effects of their decisions oh yeah like like in all sincerity how do you expect it's like they think everyone is redstone apartments or something like that, where they own like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rental units. And maybe they make more money and they can afford it. But most landlords in Burlington are actually folks like my mom and I, my husband and I co-own this property with my mom. And, you know, we wanted to have an asset in the family. We want to make sure that, you know, she's taken care of in the future and that there is a place no matter what. And like, you guys are literally taking away my ability to take care of my family because you think I've just got this pile of Scrooge McDuck money in my basement that, you know, when I feel like it, I go down and I start, you know, doing a backstroke through and it's just, it's not true. Mm -hmm. And I, so it's like, where do you get this idea from? And then why don't you consider the, like, who, do you, do you believe that it is my obligation to pay for my tenants to live in my house? Like, is that what you believe? You believe it is my duty and responsibility to pay for mm -hmm. them to live in my house. Why would I do that? I mean, exactly. to be, to be fair, we do rent below market value because we think that market value here is out of control and it feels like highway robbery and it makes me feel guilty. And be, and so as a result, we rent to first responders, we rent to nurses and people who live locally, who mm -hmm. provide a, a necessary service to the community. Well, I guess everybody's necessary, but you get what I'm saying. I do. I'm digressing, Chris. I interrupted you. Finish no, that's absolutely you fine. Saying. You're 100 <laughs> right. There are lots of issues with with renting in Burlington, and and Burlington does have a a a very high percentage of residents that are renters, and that right. again adds another layer of complication to the mix. And it is an almost a completely unhealthy number percentage of renters in the makeup of Burlington, and that number exists because of the fact that there are no, no homes for sale in the Burlington, in the city of Burlington, in the entry level housing market. That's right. You cannot, right. you can truly not find anything for a family um, under $350,000 in this town. And if you do find something listed for that, that price, uh, there will be a bidding war and it will probably close for about 50 to $75,000 more than that. So, yep. Uh, you're just forced and relegated to to um, renting. And that number is actually a really important number. I don't want to skim by it because it, we talk mm -hmm. about 350, but the settled number is usually um, around four uh, is what you're going to end up selling that house for. And that becomes very, very problematic because... Mm -hmm. 
a VA guaranteed loan. So we're talking about people who've served their country, who honorably, who have access to a, a VA guaranteed loan that caps out at about four hundred sixteen, four hundred seventeen thousand dollars. So we're talking about not even having a housing market that could sustain or be welcoming to, um, you know, our veterans. How much even? Well, and that's the thing is, think about that. If if the average house, what is the average house again? Here in Burlington? Yeah. Well, it depends upon the you neighborhood. What it was? But if you're in, if you're in my neighborhood in the old north end, you're looking at um old 150-year-old uh cottage or farmhouse style homes with slope ceilings, 150 years old, um probably about 900 square feet at best, you know, a, a medium sized master bedroom and two small closet bedrooms with a, maybe a downstairs bathroom at, you know, for so about 420. That's what, so you figure 420, that's like a, that's like a $4,000 a month mortgage. And that doesn't include your property taxes, your homeowner's insurance. That doesn't include saving and setting anything aside for when your furnace dies or your, or your range dies or you need a new roof or whatever. That's you have to be able to pay four to maybe like fifty five hundred dollars a month just for your housing costs mm -hmm. in order to buy a home in Burlington. And to rent, it isn't even much better because if you're a family of three, you know, um, uh, two parents and three children. So say you're looking to rent a four bedroom uh, apartment or home in Burlington, you're looking at spending uh, $4,000 easily, easily every, every month. Uh, so not only are houses too expensive to, for veterans to purchase our housing and rental supply of housing is too expensive for families to live here, which yep. only perpetuates the problem even more because then these, these landlords still want that amount of money for these four or five bedroom homes that, um, are old, uh, Yep. And they end up renting them to people, but that forces them to go online to Craigslist and Facebook and forces mm -hmm. many people into these communal <laughs> living situations, which actually afford them less legal rights yep. uh, than they would have if they had signed a, a lease contract or, again, if they owned their own property, which you don't have any greater housing security than owning your own property. Uh, which brings us back to the issue at hand. Uh, yes. Because of these two ballot initiatives that Burlington voted upon, the Just Cause Eviction and the Thermal Energy Solutions, that puts landlords and property owners in a very unique and a very difficult position where they are now being told that they have to continue to rent to people, step one. Step two, they're being told that they're going to have to upgrade and put thousands of dollars into these units that they are now admittedly have less control over. And that's just the first two steps. You know that there have already been rumblings about, quote, rent yeah. control prices and price options. So what's in it for the landlords at this point? Uh, if yeah. they're smart about this, they would seriously be reevaluating their business model and considering going a different route or pivoting slightly. They already own the properties and they manage the properties simultaneously. So they have the ability to convert many of these units from rental or they can pivot their business model from uh, renting to condo or co-op model where they sell the individual units, put them on the market and list them and people can purchase one or two units, tear down a wall the same way that they've done in other cities. Yep. Uh, they could purchase these units and then one that the landlord gets this massive influx of money because they've just sold the property. They've, um, and then they can do whatever what they want with that. They can retire, they can do whatever. Um, but they could also just continue to maintain the properties, charge a small HOA fee for collecting taxes and waste removal and coming to make sure the roof is okay. Um, and it opens up the housing market in Bur the entry level in the housing market in Burlington all across the board because there are so many uh, rental units in this town. It's such a high percentage of the housing stock. 
Um, yep. There are citywide regulations that are limiting to condo and uh, condo conversion of rental units, but those regulations are really only applicable to units or buildings that have more than 10 units. Uh, right across, oh. right, off, right, out the, right out of the gate, almost any restrictions and regulations on rental housing or rental stock, um, owner occupied duplexes are automatically excluded. So that's why years ago you saw the great uh, migration over to Airbnb because the landlords are just sick and tired of dealing with some deadbeats that they had to deal with. And they just decided to pull their, their extra units off the market and do it Airbnb style. They figured they had more success doing that. And I don't, I don't blame them for that. Uh, that's you can make property. more money. Th yeah, they you can, can make, make some more, more money. money. And less heartache and head and, and you know you you have you don't give up control of your property you're not giving rights to somebody like people don't realize that in burlington especially our tenants have more rights to our property than we do um and and i maybe that's hyperbolic but if it is it's only like this much hyperbolic because to get a person who is not paying their rent out, uh, an eviction process takes six months minimum, usually. Maybe three months if it's not winter time and somehow, I don't know, they're cooperative or something like that. But every landlord I talk to says it takes about six months. So that means I could have somebody living in my house for six months not paying rent, being mm -hmm. a jerk, wrecking stuff, doing whatever, and I have no recourse. It doesn't matter if it puts me in harm's way. It doesn't matter if it puts me in financial harm's way. It, it literally doesn't matter because I cannot remove people from my house. And so I thought this idea, like this is when I say Republicans, when I said Republicans have better ideas than, than the left, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So we could actually take existing units, convert them to condos, and then create a whole new housing market for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to buy and live here. Or, yeah, you're or, absolutely or right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And the, the big problem with Burlington in general is the fact that, yes, a solution that naturally comes up is people say, well, we could build more homes. Well, yes, in theory, we could. And trust me, I totally advocate for building new homes in Burlington all the time. Mm -hmm. The problem is, uh, the regulations in the state make it such that if you plan on trying to build something, it could take 10 years to um, to actually get it constructed. And there's a lot of struggling and fighting in the courts because of Act yep. 250 and, and the fact that anybody, almost anybody in this state can, um, if they have $47, they can go to the courthouse and they can file a claim to block your build. So yes building new homes is an important part of this plan but at the same time we have to be realistic that it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem today and it most likely wouldn't solve the problem for almost 10 years so how oh do God. we create new housing opportunities for people in burlington and there are plenty of rental units in this town um putting these units on the market in addition it totally opens up the entry level market because we would flood the market with almost 2,200 units in the course of 18 months. And that would be incredible to be able to do something like that. But it also <clears throat> builds wealth because nothing is going to um, inspire wealth cr uh, creation in, in starting families and new American families other than property ownership. That is the greatest way to create and start wealth and grow wealth. And then you also, say you like we said something. before, it's there's pride. no greater housing security than owning your own apartment or owning your own home. So if if we can if we want to provide housing security for people, then let's start, let's incentivize selling these units because another problem is winterizing, right? The city and the state, they always talk about wanting to winterize rent, rental units. Well, there's really nothing in it for in the landlords for it, you know, because the tenant pays their heating costs on their own generally. So going in and updating expensive windows would just be a cost that the landlord would have to absorb. But if we sell these units and put them on the market, then 
the people who live there are the homeowners. And so if they want to put in new windows, they can either bring it up at an HOA meeting or they could just order them and have them installed. So you can actually achieve that goal of, of, of energy efficiency much easier by spreading it around and, and, and building this wealth in the entry level market. Okay. <clears throat> so now here's the obvious argument that members of our city council would have. I already, I can already hear it. Oh, but that's still you there because they're trying to make it so you can't do Airbnb anymore. Uh, or they're significantly trying to curtail people's ability to have Airbnb here. So they would say, well, you're just, that's still just taking rental units off the market. And, and we don't like that. If Burlington wants to, if Bur the city of Burlington wants to house people, I suggest the city of Burlington build houses for people. Uh, <laughs> if, if they want to have apartments for so people, simple. I suggest that they dig deep in their pockets or dig into their sofas for, you know, coins and, and dollar bills and, and build housing. If you want public housing in Burlington, build it build it I, I don't know like public <laughs> but public if you want is... to protect our housing stock which is something that the progressives talk about wanting to do all the time they want to protect the charm of these historic neighborhoods if you want people to reinvest in these old victorian little mcmansions that we have up here the best way to do that is by having people take on the responsibility of home ownership inside of them yep Yep. As opposed a to renting them out expensively to college kids that are are let's just be fair, hard on the on the buildings. Yes. You know, they're just hard well, on that's them. That's the thing. We're not allowed to um, discriminate against college kids, and yet they're more likely to wreck your stuff. <laughs> and they also are part of the, the cause of the high cost of living. So because we have all these wealthy people who send their kids to UVM, um, which at one point was the most expensive state university in the country. I don't know if that's still the case, but I remember it yeah. was like eight years ago or something like that. I remember that was the case. So you got all these wealthy people sending their little bratty rich kids up here to go to college. And yes, I'm talking to you bratty college kids. I don't care if I'm offending you, suck it up. But like, and their parents will pay whatever the cost is. You know, I, I think John and I last week on the show, we're talking about, I said, I knew a kid, I knew people in college whose parents bought apartment buildings for them to go to college here. Mm -hmm. And now they, they lecture people, others on privilege. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Like, right. When somebody who owns an apartment building lectures me or you on privilege, it's just like, come on, man. <laughs> come on. How do you say this uh, stuff with a straight face sometimes? That's what I'm saying. So like, doesn't this seem like a better, like we want to encourage. Okay. Let me back up. I got too many things running through my brain right now. So did you say there were 2,200 units possible? Well, so it's important to think about it in different, <laughs> um, you have to break down the, um, the density of each ward essentially and right. look at what the housing stock is that's made up of in those neighborhoods. And so if you're talking about, okay, so if you're talking about Burlington, the whole circle of the city uh there's a lot of diversity in a, in rental units there are some some high rise um 30 units or more but a lot of rental units in wards two and three the old north end area and parts of the south and those tend to be homes that were converted so you're talking about mm. unit or apartment buildings that have six or seven or eight units and ultimately the city regulations say that if you have 10 units or less you could um you could convert over to a condo or co-op style of of building okay uh, relatively relatively easily there are some regulations based upon um tax parcels uh, that I'm still mm. trying to find some answers on, but that would be more a domino effect issue. You'd have to work out the timing on how 
you might have to go smaller, very micro in how you start to um, convert units. Like you might have to start in the outsides and then start <laughs> moving them inwards that way. Um, well, and like, I'm thinking in, in the new North End, as an example, much of our neighborhood is low density residential which means you're not supposed to have more than a duplex unless you get special permission from the city. Mm. So unless there was an apartment building in this area already, I, I almost think it wouldn't even be an option here because only duplexes are allowed. God, I hate zoning. I hate you zoning. Have like, you have like Clary Point. And do you have in the new North end, you have places like Clary point and other, and other places that are larger apartment buildings though, too. Correct. See, that's what I'm trying to understand. So it must Hannah, be that, like, such, there are those larger buildings that they definitely wouldn't qualify for a conversion because they exceed. Cause they're too big. See, yeah. that's what I'm trying to understand. I know we're in a low density residential area, but I don't know how you get special permission to have more than a duplex. Like, we're yeah. in court with the city. We've been in court with the city for the last two and a half years trying to keep our third unit that's existed since 1963. Mm. So I don't know how, like, I don't know who you got to be friends with. I, I think you just you need be... pockets. I think you need to have deep enough pockets to be able to fight mm. in court for 10 years to get it done. And that's ultimately what it boils down to. If you, want... <laughs> you know what? Yeah. And you, you know what, Chris? Yes, ma'am. If I hadn't been in court for the last two and a half years, I would have spent that money upgrading the insulation on our building like they want us to. Mm -hmm. But it costs over $10,000 and we spend all our money on attorney fees. So, excuse me, you can tell I'm very bitter. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm resentful about it. But okay, so this is a really cool idea. So, I want to take a minute. Okay, hold on. I'm going to take a break. Sure. Unless unless there was something you wanted to say to finish up this topic, I don't want to cut you off. Oh no, I, I think that I think that this is a great opportunity for Burlington because by by putting so many houses apartments on the market to purchase, um, it becomes equitable for people. Uh, for diverse communities are all having access to it because what we have currently today are nothing coming on the market. So that doesn't increase equity. Um, it doesn't build wealth in new communities. And what we also find, which I find extremely troubling um, and worrisome are the amount of homes that transfer without even a sign going in the yard, just private yep. sales that get passed around left and right. And you don't, Yep. you know, that's not equitable. There's, <laughs> there's nothing. That's, you are correct. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Okay, so we're going to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Perihelion Design. So everybody check out my necklace. It's beautiful. I wish I could get closer. I need somebody here to do um, focusing for me. But I love this piece. I think I highlighted this one on the perihelionvt.com website a couple weeks ago. because And I loved it. And I said, I need to model that one. And I'm probably going to keep it. Sorry, suckers. But maybe if you order it, this might be one she can make for you. Shannon, is this a one-of-a-kind design or is this one that you would be able to make again? All this, all strands of pearls. It's so beautiful. Oh, my God. Okay. I'm going to share the website with you guys. Let's see here. Love it. Love it. Love it. I love the work that Shanna does. She's got a lot of amazing creations. She does necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and they all are very different and unique. Okay. So here's the one I'm wearing right here. And look at that $60 for that. Like all those pearls and little crystals and stuff, just absolutely amazing and beautiful. Um, I showed this one previously because I love this. I asked her, Benjamin, if you're watching, I actually asked her if she could make a man version of this for you because I think that you would love it and it would go with like your dashikis and stuff like that um, or maybe his Black Panther costume or something. I And she said, no, sorry, honey. Sucks. <laughs> I know, she doesn't have any more of the beads. Oh, ah, that looks great. So, I know, it's so cool. 
And so like, I really like her necklaces. You can probably tell I selected all necklaces to look at. Uh, Cause I just think they're super cool. And I'm a big earring person. Let's see products. I'm a big earring person. Let's see. So I love, look at these little flowers. Those are beautiful. Isn't that fun? And so if she makes a necklace, she usually makes some. Oh, I love the flowers. Look at those. Oh, wow. They Which ones? Uh, the, the, those two right there, the blue one and the red one right next to it. Aren't those fun? They're beautiful. Look at that. Look at it. That looks like a flower. That's so freaking cool. So go to paraheliumvermont.com, the hardest website name to say. Shannon, why did you pick such a weird name that's so hard to say? Okay. P-E-R-I-H-E-L-I-O-N-V-T.com. That's P-E-R-I-H-E-L-I-O-N-V-T.com. Paraheliumvermont.com. Check them out order online. You can place custom orders. There's a contact page. Get in touch. And she's local, right in Grand Isle. So love Shop local. it. Shop local. Do, 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 do. Okay. So I thought I would also take a minute while we're, while we're taking a break, thanking our sponsor. Did I say that part? Pair Healing Vermont, today's sponsor. Um, so we've got a website, Shannon County GOP. This is our website, right? Ooh, there's stuff going on. Oh, notice of a meeting. Wait. Oh, wait. This is old. We got to update this, Chris. Yes, ma'am. This ma is what we're working on, right? So yes, this is really, this is what we're working on. Here's the Facebook page. So the big, big thing going on right now in, in the world. Oops, there we are. Look at that. Oh, that's so meta. Not really. Okay. One of the big things that's going on right now is, is the Republican party. I don't want to say we're rebranding because that doesn't sound right, but there is definitely a concerted effort right now by the party to work on our platform, uh, to work on our messaging. As I mentioned, you're the communications chair. So why don't you share with our viewers a little bit about what that process has been like, um, what you're looking forward to in the future, and what kinds of things people can expect from the Republican Party in the next election cycle. Okay, so I think that it, um, I think that you're right to say that we are going through a slight rebranding, and I don't think that there's anything really negative with that. I think that as responsible adults, we have to constantly be mm. self-evaluating where we are at and, and 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 trying to always better ourselves and our messaging and i think that if that wants to be labeled as rebranding then so be it but i call it growth um yeah and <clears throat> it's something that really should take place after every election you know parties should sit yeah. down and they should reevaluate what part of their messaging landed and resonated with voters uh, what demographics did you gain ground in? And and are we listening to these demographics as to what their needs are? Um, that's what that's I... What, that's what... Yeah. Well, as, as a candidate last year, I, it really hit me. At, and I went to an event, and it was actually for Molly Gray, but she invited all candidates to go. And so I went. And I was talking to a couple of young ladies who were UVM students, and she said, one of the gals said something to the effect of, you know, well, what, you know, oh, all you Republicans talk about is taxes and small businesses. All you care about is taxes and small businesses. What's that got to do with me? And I just went, wow. Well, it's they amazing are, that they don't they realize like, what taxes and small businesses actually mean to her. Um, but at the same time, she probably goes out and says shop local. So, and so this is like, we're, we are clearly not doing a good job of messaging to people why we care about those things. Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's probably, uh, it was probably a renter who came up to you because if a prop, a property <laughs> owner knows why taxes are important, a renter just thinks that their landlords being mean when their rent goes up, they'd have no realization or understanding of the fact that that rent might have gone up because their 
school taxes or their property mm-hmm. taxes went up or there was some unfunded mandate where they have to retrofit all their thermal energy heating solutions for their building. <laughs> like They have no, they think that their landlords are like Scrooge McDuck and that they just have this vat of money that they can draw upon to, to essentially take care of these adult children that, that mommy and daddy aren't paying for anymore, or maybe they are paying for them still, but they don't seem to understand why small businesses are important. Apparently they don't understand how many businesses in America are small businesses and how they drive the economies. And they clearly don't understand how taxes impact their, their own housing costs. Well, and that's what, when you see the disparity in states, as an example, I started my business when I was living in Texas and a corporation, an LLC in Texas does not pay a dime of income tax until, an, so an S corporation or a C corp doesn't pay a dime of state tax until they make $10 million. So they really set it up that they want people to start businesses, hire people and create things. And they give you a very long runway to work with. The barrier to entry is very low. You, there's not tons of regulations. You don't have to have every certificate in the book. You like, you don't have to have a cert- if you're a hair braider, you don't have to have a barber's certificate. You know that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so I think your point was really smart, which is, at the end of an election cycle, how did we do? It's it's like, um, oh my god, why can't I think of the word? Um, getting notes from your director after a show, you sit down and you go, okay, what worked? What didn't, what did we miss? What do we need to improve? Did you ever play sports growing up? Like, you know, after a meet or a practice, your coach would sit you down and talk to you about what you need to work on. Well, these are the areas that we need to work on. And messaging is something that every political party needs to work on. Uh, because the way we're communicating with each other right now is, uh, needs improvement. I think that's the to fairest way I can put it. It needs improvement. <laughs> say the least. So what so what's the GOP got going on right now? What are you the most excited about that you've been working on or is coming down the the pipe? So being a conservative in Vermont is is a little difficult. I'm sure it's difficult for many people around this country, but there is we're very fragmented here uh, because of mm. this, our smaller numbers and so and our remote locations. So what I am truly excited about recently has been trying to bring us together um, more more at a county level, which I think is really helpful because we mm-hmm. tend to be small municipalities that are spread out and and made up of different demographics. But I think that uh, since Vermont doesn't have, anything when it comes to county governance i think that yeah. um, i think that it's something that we can draw upon as a way to try and unite our communities um and provide some strength in numbers so uh here in chittenden county we have our largest city is burlington and it is a democratic and progressive stronghold we haven't mm-hmm. had um a republican in office since mr kurt wright left uh, city council and we haven't had a republican mayor in quite some time mm. Uh, that being said, just 15, 20 minutes outside of town, um, we have other other municipalities like Milton and Essex that do have a more vibrant, conservative, Republican um, mm. population. And so we're trying to bring all these people together from Milton, Colchester, Essex, Shelburne, Burlington, the three of three Republicans that are in Burlington. I'm just <laughs> there, there are more than three of us. Uh, but you know we're trying to we're trying to come together and and in coming together we're we're bouncing ideas off each other we're trying to be more efficient in our messaging and making sure that we're there to support each other so when when towns are having events or candidates that come up it is our goal to make sure that we can um, amplify that messaging by bouncing it out into the county making sure that that goes out through our social medias and that we can let other people in outside of that small town uh, in the rest of the county, um, know about them, know about the event, that we can support them. Hopefully they can uh, gain donors that way and we can build up messaging and uh, amplifying conservative voices. 
I'm really excited about that. We're also working on building a newsletter uh, to, again, continue to amplify and uh, conservative voices and, and put out a proper messaging between people because we've had a very fragmented messaging system here and it didn't have as much of the breadth of um, the reach that it should have had. It's been driving me crazy, Chris, with the 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 Facebook pages and the Instagram and the website. I'm like, is there nobody who can, you know, this was previously I was complaining about it. Um, now that, you know, I've been led in the club, uh, I'm asking like, why is it, what is, why have we not had social media? Why is the website not updated? Is there no one to do this? Like, if, if we don't, like the news is not going to cover us fairly, right? We already know this. We already know that we're not going to get a sh fair shake from WPTZ or VT Digger or whatever. So we need to really be putting out our own content. Why ha do you have an idea of why that's been so lacking in the past? I don't necessarily, I wouldn't want to speculate as to what was, uh, the, what causes were in the past. Uh, there are many issues that can arise in Vermont. Uh, the fragmented nature of the party is definitely something to overcome. Uh, it was more prior to this year, we've had much more of like a confederation approach to things where, you yeah. know, this is going on in this town. So that's, but it's not my town. So uh, we're trying to overcome that, um, that obstacle and, and, bring people together that way. Uh, when it yeah. comes to messaging, I think that there are, there have been solid steps taken uh, to put out good conservative messaging. We have True North Reports and Guy Page right. with the Vermont Daily yep. Chronicle. Uh, yep. They are great sources and we hope to be promoting them more so on our county webpage also, which is cool. uh, coming up. This, pat this week we should be we, there should be updates to the communications page on the county website. So when you get time um, after today, if you're watching this on uh, May 8th or after, uh, feel free to stop by at www.ccgopvt.org. Oh. Correct? Did I say that right? I don't I know. I got it right, man. I hope I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Chittenden County website I was looking at says Chittenden County. Wait, Ch it says Chittenden GOP. Is that so? Is it going to be something different? No, I, I thought it was. Man. <laughs> uh, the one we were looking at with Ronald Reagan on the front is Chittenden County Republican Party. Oh, it's Chittenden GOP. So I bet, I wonder if it's something different since this is all old stuff. So, well, I guess this is the point, right? So this is the whole thing is we're doing a whole revamp. Oh, we're, we're, given, yeah. we're giving the GOP a facelift. Yes. We're bringing it into the 21st century. Um, yeah, look at look up, we'll look it up and we'll make sure to put a link in the website. Um, we're trying to get control back of the Burlington GOP Facebook and website and stuff like that because that all, you know, the... <sighs> I don't want to skip over the fact what you said about us being fractured because I posed this question uh, to my network recently and I said, why is it that conservatives are more committed to whatever their pet cause is than working together as a group to get candidates elected, right? So many like social conservatives and fiscal conservatives don't agree on things like abortion, right? But you need the same people to vote for you in reality. And you need the same people to be willing to volunteer for you and donate to your campaign. And if everyone, instead of like putting their foot, you know, digging their feet in and being like, no, I'm not going to be friends with you. And I'm not going to support you because I don't like this one thing that you think like we need to come together and support mm -hmm. one another and it's like a it's like a big dysfunctional family, right? Like you've got you've got the Trump Republicans, and then you've got the social, uh, you know, what is uh, you know people who are socially liberal and fiscally conservative, and then you've got the libertarians, and then you've got the anarcho capitalists. Well, I guess that's kind of different, but still, like even those people basically still need to vote conservative if they hope to have anything that they actually want. 
not saying I'm into anarchy, I'm not, but like, I would just really love to see the Republican party set aside their differences. Like I have members of my family that drive me absolutely insane. Like I want to punch them out sometimes, but that doesn't mean that I stop loving them. It doesn't mean that I stop caring about them. I still want them to be successful and be happy. And I want for us to have better communication. And if us Republicans can't get along, how do we hope to affect change in Vermont or in the country? I mean, I agree. I think that it really comes down to being able to put together a, a good messaging campaign. And I think that we have strong strategies. I think that we have good beliefs and we have noble causes that we stick up for. Um, when it comes down to it, it really has to do with with the messaging, what we are saying and how we are putting it out there, the ways we, that we do this and the frequency yeah. that we do it, the ways that we do this will expand our the reach of our messaging. Because like you said before, there are we aren't going to get positive coverage from the press here in Vermont. We aren't going to get positive coverage from Seven Days or VT Digger, or even if the free press were to even show up, which they don't cover local issues anymore. So, you know, we have to be able to amplify our own media, which fortunately we have access to. I am grateful for the media that is already in place and we should build upon yep. that and we should amplify their messaging. Um, yep. There are plenty of independents and libertarians in this state that that we can pull in to our cause and and into our caucus if, with proper yep. messaging, and I think that is the best way to go. Uh, but I also think that <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of closeted conservatives in Vermont um, that don't vote because they've really reached the point of of what what difference does my one Republican vote make anymore? Uh, but if we get yeah. some good messaging out and some momentum out there, then those closet conservatives, especially if there's mail in ballots coming to their house, they're more likely to vote and mail them in. Uh, we saw in just, Burlington this last election, we had thousands of ballots that went out, only about half the electorate voted. So whether that's, right. that's a, a vote for the status quo or just a, a vote for malaise and ignorance, that whichever it is, like we can tap into that and we can motivate those thousands of, of Burlingtonians to come out and yep. support uh, conservative candidates. Yep. The and we're going to make sure that they realize them. that the Republican Party is not a dirty word. You don't have to run as an independent. We can get together and talk about issues from a conservative standpoint, yeah. and we can come up with causes to, to fight for. That's right. That is absolutely right. And I just think that there's so many things, like so many perspectives that conservative-minded people have to offer that would provide great opportunities and solutions to the problems that we're facing and and, and but it's like it's the the you know the hardest part is reaching out to those apathetic voters or or non-voters the people who have said it just does like you said they just think it doesn't matter anymore and and i really i really want to encourage people just like you just did to come out and give the Republican Party a second look. If you don't like what's happening to the police department, if you don't like all these charter changes, if you want to retain personal property rights, if you don't want somebody to tell you that you have to get a vaccine and then carry around a little piece of paper, if you believe in an election integrity, if you believe in personal responsibility and hard work, sacrifice and community, then you belong in the Republican Party. And I know that that sounds crazy, but but we are the party of the working class. We are the party of the 99% now. We really, really are because we want people to be able to take care of themselves and take care of their families. And it is, I, I don't think it is uh, too much of a stretch to say that at least in Vermont and in Burlington, the progressives and Democrats are the party of the wealthy elitists. And they are committed to making sure that they get past whatever it is they want and, and they will not suffer the consequences of the, their behavior 
because they're rich. So they say that they're for poor people. They say that they're for not white people. And yet we see over and over again that the result is negative towards the same people that they say that they're for. Oh, yeah. And so I just I love we see it all the uh, time with the progressives and the Democrats in, in town, The one, especially the ones that love to grandstand um, yep. about housing costs. But then they still they will fight or try to obstruct any kind of new development that takes place in this town. Mm -hmm. They talk about wanting to reform the yep. police and end over criminalization. But this past week, the city council or last week, the city council passed an ordinance that outlawed um, gas powered leaf blowers. So while we want to end over criminalization, city council decides that they're going to send the cops to your house over a leaf blower. Um, I don't know. I, I, they it, they it, seem it, to not please. recognize the complicity in 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 overtaxing the police and putting them in situations where they don't need to be in any way. Well, and it's like, do they not know, like you have to not know what's going on in the city to think it's a good idea. We, we are a small city of about 50,000 people that deals with sex trafficking, drug trafficking, illegal border stuff, including drugs and bad stuff. It's not just people coming to work on the farms. OK, mm -hmm. there's human traffickers and sex traffickers. You know, there's. I just really believe that if all of the people who just who just check the, the box, right, they go into low information voters. And I'm sorry if you're insulted. I'm not sorry if you're insulted, but people who just go into the voting booth and go D, 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 P, 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 because, well, because that's there for poor people. They're for people. Republicans are racist. Like you are, you don't understand uh, if you're not actually looking at the policies and, and then not just what the policy is, but what the results of that policy are. You're absolutely right. And and a big problem is the fact that we as the party, as the Republican Party in this town and in this county, we have not been putting forward candidates. So that narrative that that they believe about us only gets reinforced by the sheer fact that we aren't on the stage to deny it. So we need to run candidates that come up and actually offer these perspectives um, as alternatives for them to vote for. Otherwise, right. all they otherwise we're leaving the all the cards on the table because we're just we've already given up. Well, and so. I wrote something down that you said earlier before we went live about better ideas for governor governance are. I'm going to say this wrong. Basically, it's better to do governance at the local level, and you come up with better ideas and better solutions. And we've got we've got nobody. For, this is what's funny. I keep getting called to join city committees and commissions because people know that I'm a Republican and they want some, some, some people want diversity on their boards. And I'm like, you know, there's more Republicans in town, but this is my point. You get phone calls. I don't get phone calls. They don't call me asking me to oh, join these commissions. Honey, I have I to go will... hunt them down and be like, oh, no. hey, I hear there's a seat on this commission. <laughs> I will send them to you from now on. And anybody else, here's the thing. Anybody else that's watching, if you want to get involved, you message me on Facebook and I will connect you with the people who can appoint you or that can help you through the application process. Because it, it literally is like committees and commissions in Burlington are what are making the governance decisions here. Mm -hmm. So unelected officials that are appointed by their homeboys and their homegirls are who's deciding the policy and putting it forth to city council to vote on. So you actually have the power, all of you watching right now, actually have the ability to apply for and make a difference. You don't have to run for a state house representative. You don't have to be a city councilor. You could be a school board member. You could be a fire commissioner. You could mm -hmm. be a charter change committee member. And I understand there's a lot of reluctance in society, especially in today's cancel culture, to not to be apprehensive about running for a big seat like yep. House or Senate or city council or or mayor. And I understand the apprehension on that. But that 
almost doesn't even materialize when it comes to um, running for or putting your name into submission for a, a commission seat because there's no there's no real campaign. You know, you yep. don't have the mud slinging. So I I strongly encourage any any conservatives in the area, especially here in Burlington, to please submit your names for any of the commissions, and you can check them out on the city's website. They they oftentimes have them listed. I believe there are two new two seats opening up on the police commission. And I strongly encourage any conservative. I, I want, I hope a conservative can land one of those seats. Uh, personally, I will be putting my name in for the submission. I hope that Good. Uh, Erica, I hope I encourage you to do it also. I, as many, as many conservatives as want to uh, please reach out and try. Uh, it will let send a message to city council that uh, the Republican party is no longer hibernating in this town. Yep. And here's the stop being a chicken. Every, I can't stop being a chicken. Yeah. Everybody that's out there, like you think in your mind, right? And I know how this is. I know, I know it may sound shocking, Christopher, that I, Erica Reddick, at one point was too afraid to do stuff in politics because I didn't want to have my feelings hurt. I, no, it's I fair. Up. They're real nasty. They, I mean, it's, and that's, it's not schoolyard nonsense. They say some things and they dig so deep that they will, they can level you emotionally. And you see that happen on a larger scale nationwide from coast to yep. coast. And it is, I, I respect and, and understand. But here's the thing. And that, but that's the thing. See, here's the thing. I get it only this much because the one thing that I know for sure is that we will never be insignificant enough for them to leave us alone. We will never be small enough to be treated with dignity and respect. And by shrinking ourselves, hoping and praying that they'll leave us alone and no one will see me and no one will know, not only does it embolden the people that you're afraid of, it makes bullies worse when you shrink from them. But you're making it worse for your community members. So you're also so not only are you a coward, but you're selfish. And I'm, and I'm not. There's a lot of fairness that. in that. I mean, it's really um, it's it's it cuts to it cuts deep, but it's the truth. You have we all have to overcome that self doubt and and stand up because uh, our voices need to be heard. And and there is a level of there's a level of vulnerability that you can take into place. Like you, you don't necessarily have to go all the way out, but stand up. You can stand up and stand still if you'd like, but stand up because it's time to do it. Um, it's, yep. there are, if you're tired of seeing the way that your city is being run, <clears throat> if you, if you think that, not everything's bad, but there are some ways that they could do better. Stand up. And, and and because you can offer a unifying voice where we talk about not necessarily everything that we do that's wrong or different, but things that we have in common and build these bridges and we can reach out and actually solve a lot of the problems that are facing us yep. instead of manufacturing problems to grandstand around, which yep. is what we're all left with. When, yep. when we aren't even invited to the table anymore because we don't have anybody anybody running. And you know yep. what they say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Oh, oh my goodness. All right, I think that's a good place to put a pin in this, our conversation, Christopher. I cannot believe it's already been 90 minutes. I know, that went right? by so fast. It did go by pretty fast. Oh my <laughs> God, go okay. So before I let, uh, before we end the live stream, is there anything else? So give people some places. Um, let's see what, let's, before we go, let, what meetings do we have planned coming up that people can attend? Okay. So I believe that there is a Burlington GOP meeting scheduled for the 25th of yeah, so May. It's the fourth, it's the fourth Tuesday of each month. Yes, ma'am. Right? That will be the twenty fifth of of May two thousand and twenty one. At six thirty. Yes. At St. Mark's. Right. 
on North. Yes, ma'am. That's what the St. Mark's yes. School, right behind the uh, the the church. Okay, St. Mark's School on North Avenue. So that's the Burlington GOP. So if you're a Burlington resident and you have a vested interest in Burlington not sucking, I shouldn't say it like that. But being no, but full, it, yep. If you're and conservative, fair. if you're conservative in Burlington or even an independent, I encourage you to come to the Burlington GOP meetings and and offer offer um offer your opinions. We're all there to That's listen. Right. Please, right. please come. Um, Benjamin and, said that last quote was strong. He was talking about you. <laughs> yeah, if you're not at the table. You're on the menu. That's really good. Okay, so then when's the next county meeting? So, uh, I'm is there one set right now? I'm not sure about the next county wide meeting. I will tell you this that we do have. Um, let me pull it up right now. It's in my files. We do have a. Let's see. Election integrity event. Here we go. We do have Chittenden County GOP Public Policy Forum okay. has an event scheduled for Tuesday, May the 18th. So if you are listening, be prepared. There is a Zoom uh, or a, yes, a virtual meeting Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, the subject is the election integrity issues from a national and state perspective. This is being offered by the Chittenden County GOP Public Policy Forum. In conjunction, we are offering, uh, featuring Josh Finley, the Director of Election Integrity from the Republican National Committee, and oh. Robert Roper, President of the Ethan Allen Institute, will be joining us to talk about uh, election integrity issues. So I strongly encourage all your viewers to contact uh, Ron Lawrence, and we'll put his oh. put his email address up, and and we'll also put this. Uh, Erica, did you get this announcement? The red, white, and blue one. No, I'm gonna stand what's up to that? Show it off. So I will send. Make sure that you get a copy of this in the next uh, fifteen minutes, and then hopefully okay. we can put that on the uh, in the comments or something. For okay, people. yeah, I can put any links and emails in the comments after. So. Um, Okay, I'm writing it down, GOP event. Okay, so we're going to add that to the comments later. And then it looks like the uh, state GOP is having their next meeting on June 26th at 10 a.m. And that you can find on the state website. Um, <laughs> Dion says he's in Bennington. Okay, but you can still get involved in your area. You can't save us here in Burlington, but you can get involved in Bennington. Please do. Um, yes. The more Reach out people... to your county chair. Talk about ways that you can make your county and your town better. So smart. That is so good. Yes, yeah. county chair, town chair, find somebody. If you can't find somebody, call me. I'll find them for you. I'll harass people until I find out where. And uh, now, Christopher, I'm going to put you on the spot before we go. Yes, ma'am. Don't you have a show possibly that you're working on yourself? Oh, I knew we should have talked about this before. <laughs> okay, so. Is that something? Is it still in the works? Are we still, it is still like still in the works? In the future? It is still in the works. We are talking about uh, creating creating a weekly Vermont news and review show, uh, mm -hmm. something that talks about, that recaps what happened and what took place in Vermont this past week. We're thinking about putting it out on on like a Friday, so that way people can enjoy it over the weekends. We're talking about um, interviewing local politicians, amplifying their voices, uh, breaking down the shenanigans of Montpelier, um, uh, rating Governor Phil Scott for the week and um, talking about different issues that are, are that are kind of plaguing our society today, especially yeah. when they come up. Um, so uh, it's in the works. We're we're working on it. We're looking to do about a a good half an hour uh, every week, and um, and I think that there's a market for it. I think that even. Even just the conservatives have a have a taste for this type of media, and I think our haters will drink it up. 
(laughs) (laughs) I love it. All right. Well, when that gets launched, we're going to tell you about it here on Generally Irritable because Christopher Aaron is one of my new favorite people. Um, I just love the work that you're doing. I love the energy that you bring to the party and to the meetings and your passion uh, is is so obvious and you ha- helped me have renew hope, renewed hope in being part of the party here. And so I just want to thank you for your service and thank you for coming on today to talk to people about what we got going on. Thank you for having me, Erica. And I appreciate it. Thank you for that tremendous compliment. And it was because of you, ma'am, because of oh you God. that yeah. I decided to stand up. So I appreciate what? everything that you do. We've had this conversation before. If it was, I I tend to be generally irritable as well. And so I tend to have this connection with you. So, but it was you standing up and and your and your determination um that that caused me to have the courage to stand up. So I'm hoping that the two of us together can um can inspire five others and maybe we can get a little uh we can get a little group going. It'd be fantastic. Some movement going. I love it. Oh my God, I'm going to cry. Okay, I'm not going to cry. Remember, Margaret Mead said, cry. never doubt. Small group of thoughtful, <laughs> committed citizens can change the world. Oh my God. Okay, there. Now we're putting a pin in it. Okay, mm-hmm. hold on with me one second, Christopher, while I end the broadcast. Do-do-do.